This is The Red Line, where we talk to three geopolitical experts about one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. For the research for this show, I watch a lot of US defense panels, talk shows, and foreign policy programs. And the thing I noticed is that the US panelists mostly talk about threats to America being all the way in the Western Pacific and the Middle East, thousands and thousands of miles away from the US homeland. They talk of these threats like they're right on their doorstep, but no one actually talks about what is on the US doorstep. No one seems to be talking about the areas that sit just to the south of the United States, what Washington is regularly referred to as its own backyard, the Caribbean. A hugely diverse range of islands with many different influences throughout the region. The British, French and Dutch all still have colonies here. The Venezuelans still have control of some of the islands. And outside powers like India, Russia and China are beginning to start sniffing around for footholds in the region. And let's not forget the elephant in the room that is the biggest island in the sea, Cuba. A nation still under heavy sanctions and embargo by the United States, desperately short on steady funds, and only 150 kilometers from the United States mainland. Will we see another player move into Cuba much like the Russians did during the Cold War? Will the US be able to keep their hold over the region? And what would the Europeans' response be if local islands started vying for independence and throwing off their colonial masters? But overall, who controls the Caribbean these days? And who will control the Caribbean? Well, to help us tackle that subject, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Trouble in the Backyard Structurally weak, highly dependent on three or four main poles of economic engagement. One pole being minerals and agriculture. Another pole being tourism. Another pole being small-scale uh, farming. Even in those places that have some minerals, there is small-scale farming that is vital. And a significant and a fourth important pole for the regions is remittances. You go to the World Bank studies, go to the IMF studies that show the significant reliance, even of places like Dominican Republic and Jamaica. Part of the devastation of COVID is not only on what the tourism industry is being affected with or by, but the impact on the remittances, the places like United States and Canada and Britain, from which most of this remittances originate, all those places have been significantly affected. And so the ability of people, family and friends in the United States and Canada and Britain and elsewhere to send stuff back is significantly affected. And so that remittance component of the economy significant for Haiti, significant to Jamaica, but they're in every part of the Caribbean, even places like Trinidad and Tobago, remittances are still critical. And so when you put the narrow base on which the economy revolves, around which the economy revolves, remittances, minerals, and those two other items, and you look at the devastation that the world is now having to uh, deal with because of COVID. You can just imagine the Herculean effort that Caribbean countries will need to make, not just to develop, but to survive. Ivor Law Griffiths is the ninth president of Fort Valley University and an expert on the geopolitics of the Caribbean. He's also a senior associate at the Center for Strategic Studies and has been a trusted expert on the Caribbean for everyone from the Foreign Ministry of Canada to the US Congress. We are thrilled to have Ivor Law back on the program. And, you know, uh, one of the bases for survival has to do with a lot of international assistance, foreign aid. That also is going to be affected in some respects, and it's going to accentuate the geopolitical games that countries like the United States and Britain and the EU and China have been playing in relation to getting what I call geopolitical market share in the Caribbean. So interesting times lie ahead. The Caribbean plays home to many of the colonial power's most profitable colonies, particularly when it came to the trade of sugar and slaves. Countries like Britain, France, Denmark, the Dutch, Spain, and even the Americas all got involved in colonizing islands in the Caribbean Sea. 
but a few of these European nations still have control over some of these islands to this day. Can you take us through some of the holdings the UK, France, and the Netherlands still have in the Caribbean and why they hold on to them? So France is a kind of a different kettle of fish, but Britain and the Netherlands still have, you know, remnants of their colonial empire. I mean, you go to Anguilla, British colony, British Virgin Islands, British colony, Cayman Islands, British colony. So there are still several useful outposts of the British Empire. But you also have, in the absence of the colonies, some still fairly strong connections to empire. Of course, it's not true that those connections to empire exist only in the Caribbean. What I'm referring to is still the legal definition of the head of state of many Caribbean countries. The head of state of Jamaica is a queen of England. The head of state of the Bahamas is a queen. The head of state of St. Kitts Nevis is a queen. So you still have a link to colonization in places that are formally independent. And it was kind of interesting to see that in Barbados a couple of months ago, there is now active talk of removing the queen as their head of state and having a formal Republican status. Now, as you know, as happens in the United Kingdom itself, there is not a direct political activism on the part of the head of state. It's a lot, it's a formality, it's a ceremonial, but it is still a tie to the empire, which many people uh, find very disconcerting. And, and, and many, one disconcerting element, and I mentioned this in the forthcoming book from University of Illinois Press, is the Privy Council as the highest the ultimate court. The United Kingdom Jews themselves have said, we're not interested in being your final court. You Caribbean countries, find your own final court. And so the final court was established called the Caribbean Court of Justice. But many places still hold on to the Privy Council. And the irony of it is Trinidad and Tobago with the Caribbean Court of Justice is headquarters, headquarters still is not interested in joining the Caribbean Court of Justice, still is interested and has the Privy Council, the British Privy Council as its final court. Same thing with Jamaica. The Netherlands, places like Curaçao, Aruba, Bonaire, what I call the ABC countries, have a kind of interesting relationship with the Netherlands as a former colonial power. There was a push for autonomy back in the late 2000s, but there were a number of management of your own house. You know, sometimes you've got a kid who wants to, I want my own place, I want to get out of this place. I don't want my parents to tell me anything more about how to live my life. But when they go on their own, they find that they can't pay their mortgage, they can't pay for their, you know, car note. And so they want to go back to mom. Some of that has been happening in the Dutch part of the Caribbean where there has been a re-establishment of a nexus with the former motherland, the Netherlands. Uh, and so there's a relationship that is fairly, fairly autonomous, but fairly strong in the connectivity with, with the Netherlands itself. Another two of the major powers in the Caribbean are the United States and Venezuela, with the United States having one of the largest colonies in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico. Can you take us through the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States and how this impacts the region? Well, you, you've, got, you've got a love-hate relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States, but you also have some prejudicial relations being manifested, continental United States or the establishment in the United States versus Puerto Rico. And there are two dimensions to this love-hate relationship. Uh, one is political, and one is cultural. There is a requirement for any state to move its status from whatever the status is to statehood to formally embrace English as its official language. Citizens, citizens of Puerto Rico that have been advocating for citizen for statehood are reluctant to give up Spanish as their language. And so you have that tension the other states in the United States and the federal government are saying, well, 
we're not going to be interested or able to make a special dispensation for you to allow you to join the statehood committee, but still remain Spanish as your, as your first, as your official language. And part of the love-hate is the reality that citizens of Puerto Rico are citizens up to a point of the United States. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Puerto Rican-born citizens can be called to serve on and can voluntarily serve in the United States Armed Forces. But citizens of Puerto Rico cannot vote for president in the United States. So there is a limit to how much of their rights of citizenship. If you move from the island and you come to the continent, you can have a change status and you can vote, register to vote. But once you remain a part of the island, uh, that ability to exercise a full full range of civil and political rights, that ability is, is limited. And so every couple of years, you have a kind of a roller coaster. Shall we move to become a state or, or not? And part of the prejudice, I think, is manifested periodically. Venezuela, on the other hand, one of the harsh realities of the Venezuelan Caribbean relationship is both an interest in being a, an imperial nation and an interest in wanting to control with the pretense of not wanting to be imperial. And so Venezuela has pushed significantly for some of those small islands that it claimed in the Caribbean Sea. Still has a formal claim against Bird Island off Antigua. And periodically it, it you know raises its sovereignty head and demarcates parts of the maritime space that impinges on those countries. You had in early this year, I think it is decree 1787, President Maduro, really trying to saber rattle against Guyana, but the decree that he issued had serious implications for the sovereignty of other countries. And so there is not so much of a colonial relationship between Saudi islands they are islands that are formally recognized as being part of the maritime space or the territorial space of Venezuela. Uh, it's a different kind of dynamic, let's say, vis-a-vis -vis United States and Virgin Islands or United States and Puerto Rico. But all that is all that said, Venezuela has some serious issues, not the least of which is the, the dynamic, sometime roller coaster relationship with. Trinidad and Tobago, where a lot of the refugees flee, uh, a growing exodus of people going to Guyana, presenting a lot of challenges there. And I'm not talking about the exodus going to Ecuador and Colombia and other parts of South America. Um, somebody was asking me yesterday at the Inter-American Defense College, do I anticipate armed resolution of the territorial dispute with Guyana? And I said, no. When you consider the econ economy and the circumstance of Venezuela, I don't think the Venezuelan establishment would be foolish enough to think that, A, they can wage a war against Guyana, even though they can win it. But it is not only occupying a territorial space, it is what implications for others in your neighborhood. Brazil would not want to allow Venezuela to occupy any place. No other South American country would want to see armed force because so many other South American countries have territorial issues. Um, and so I was saying to the, the students in the Inter-American Defense College, at the very least, United States and Brazil would want to work deliberately behind the scenes to forestall any military action being taken by Venezuela. But the Venezuela case is an interesting case for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the territorial dispute with Guyana. And if you want to hear more about the dispute between Venezuela and Guyana, you can check out our short five-minute animated video on that very topic on our YouTube channel. One of the other oddities of the Caribbean is its second largest island, the island of Hispaniola. The island is cut roughly down the middle, with the western half belonging to Haiti and the eastern half belonging to the Dominican Republic. And although both live on the exact same island, the GDP, mortality rates, crime rates, and living standards are both incredibly different. Can you take us through how this situation came to pass? 
I was sharing in another with another class that I give a lecture at Virtual University of Alberta last week that Haiti was born with an albatross around its neck that never really allowed it to develop in ways other colonies that haven't had the same kinds of albatross were able to prosper. And that albatross is the reparations that Haiti had to pay to France for decades. It was a point in which, it was a point in time in Haiti's history where it was borrowing money from French banks to pay to the French government. And so, partly because of the reparations, you having to pay back France for your freedom, Haiti was not able to invest in those basic elements of governing your state in its roads, in its health, in its education, in all in its agriculture, in those basic elements of meaningful qualities of life in ways in which the Dominican Republic was able to do. But you also have had in Haiti, you had more internecine strife, more jockeying for position, for power. And so people were so much, so very often consumed with trying to get power that they place secondary emphasis on how to govern properly. About a decade and a half ago, when I was still at Florida International, very actively involved with what the United States Southern Command that is headquartered in Miami did, I remember saying at a, a forum, it used to be monthly forums convened by the command of the Southern Command, bringing together academics who specialize in Latin America and the Caribbean, people from the CIA, people from the Defense Department, State Department. And the question he was posing to all of us is, what should the United States do in preparation for some impending elections? You know, how can the United States help to ensure that there, there are free and fair elections? When it came to me, there were about 14 or 15 of us around this nice table in the commander's conference room. I said, Commander, I want to recommend that you ask a different question. And that is, what can the United States, what should the United States do after the elections are held? And I began to explain to him that democracy has a significant flaw to it. And it's a flaw that is manifested in all many parts of the world, including the United States. And, the, and the democracy presumes that people who get elected know how to govern, which is not the case. Sometimes people who are elected as governors or members of parliament or House of Representatives people don't have a clue as to what to do. But in places like Britain and the United States, there are institutions to help them to know how to do their work. And so I said to the commander, United States needs to begin to help people who are elected in Haiti to know what is it the boundaries and the permissibilities of their office are. Because a lot of them just don't know. You know the, the power of being elected as a representative or a governor or a, or a president is so consuming you think you have ultimate ability to do anything you want, to appoint your cousins, your family who have no qualifications in positions. And I think Haiti has suffered from that disconnect between adequate governance and the knowledge about how to adequately govern. And that is a challenge that is a perennial challenge. And it partly explains why you've got relative wealth on the eastern part of the island of Hispaniola, part called the Dominican Republic, and you've got relative poverty on the western part. In 1823, U.S. President James Monroe put forward the Monroe Doctrine, proclaiming the Caribbean to be the United States' backyard, that any foreign power moving in there would be seen as a direct threat to the United States. And for the most part, it held up for over a century. But mostly because the profitable islands had all been gobbled up, and the colonial powers in Europe were all preoccupied with war with themselves. For over 150 years, the US ran nearly unchallenged in the Caribbean, even increasing its foothold by gaining a bunch of Britain's islands 
and bases during World War II in exchange for industrial support. That was until 1959, when a communist revolution took place on the island of Cuba. Cuba, the largest island of the Caribbean, is only 152 kilometers from Key West in Florida. And the revolution threw off the corrupt US-supported farmers and took control of this country, just off the US coast, for the communists. This was the first time an enemy of the US had been within 200 kilometers of the mainland since the Mexican-American War. And this time, Cuba had planes and tanks and missiles through their close relationship with the Soviet Union. The Soviets could use Cuba to finally threaten the US with missiles, the same way that the US threatened the Soviets with missiles in Turkey. Cuba became the biggest threat to the United States almost overnight, and was one of the dominant actors in the Caribbean for decades to come. But what is their position like now? Are they still supporting socialist fighters in countries like Colombia and Angola, or are they now confined to the islands of Cuba itself? Well, for that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. A Shrinking Shoreline Well, the Caribbean is that imaginary, wonderful place surrounded by the Blue Sea. It's a place of extraordinary beauty, biodiversity, and cultural diversity. And it has for over 500 years been a theater of geopolitical uh, shuffles and battles between great powers. Vicky Asavira is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council for the Caribbean Initiative. She was a founder of the Green Market in Trinidad and Tobago and has been called on regularly as an expert on the geopolitical interplay throughout the Caribbean. She joins us today. Well, we're talking on a day, uh, this is what, Tuesday? On Friday, there was a major eruption of a volcano in um, St. Vincent. And we have to say that the Caribbean is an area which is prone to these kinds of natural disasters, not only in economic terms, but in geographical terms. And yes, the COVID pandemic is a double whammy for the region, which was already indebted and suffering. So it is a very difficult balancing act for the region at this time. And we're two months away from the hurricane season. So what can I tell you? So I want to open up with today's conversation with a bit of a tricky question. Do you think the Monroe Doctrine still exists in 2021? Well, um, the Monroe Doctrine uh, was enunciated in a speech in 1823. So we are almost to 2023. It's hard to say whether the real Monroe Doctrine continues to exist, but certainly um, the hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere, has a hegemon. And that hegemon is the United States. And when they feel, uh, when that country feels threatened, yes, there could be Monroe-esque um, activities, uh, which I believe we are seeing currently with the uh, incursion of China, the One Belt, One Road initiative, obviously with the um, Venezuelan issue and the sanctions on that country pushing it towards other kinds of um, sanctioned countries, including Russia and Iran. So you continue to have those same geopolitics and a similar reaction. But I really don't think this 200-year-old doctrine is exactly the, the right vehicle to look at the region. With the Caribbean being made up of quite a few small islands, would you say that they all tend to travel in the same direction politically, or are they far more competitive with each other? We know there are organizations out there like CARICOM who are designed to coordinate Caribbean policies, but how united are these smaller island states in the Caribbean? It's a very interesting question. Um, you know, when you talk about Europe, for example, nowadays, you know, you talk about an, a European identity. The Caribbean has a Caribbean identity, and that identity is um, made, as I said, of the constant flows of people from all over the world since Columbus came and um, thought he was in the Indies. And you have, so you have these um, actual 
different ethnicities that have come together. They've pooled together over this 500 years. So it's been a constant adaptation and absorption of people. And that Caribbean people recognize this in themselves. And this is not just CARICOM, which I'll get to in a minute, but the wider Caribbean, for example, Cartagena, the part of the Yucatan that faces the Caribbean Sea, all of Northern South America, all of this is Caribbean, including really parts of the Southern United States. So there is this common identity, despite the different um, colonial powers that interacted at one point in time. CARICOM now um, coming in after independence, so we're talking about the 1960s now, and after these countries became independent largely, then there was a push to see whether or not they could unify and become something that would be like the European Union. And in fact, CARICOM is that. It is the Caribbean economic community. What hasn't happened is the mechanisms for binding it together so that there really is, like Schengen, a free movement of people and businesses throughout the region. And a part of that, again, is geography. It is, uh, you have to fly the maritime time shipping lanes are not really for moving people backwards and forwards. And so these there's some infrastructure issues that um, fragment the region. And then to your other question, which is the most interesting, are they competing against one another? Now, why would they be competing against one another except in the geopolitics of the region? You see, for them, they would be very unified if they were just dealing with themselves. But because they have to deal with the United States and the United States, for example, has other interests. So there would be an interest in what is going on in Venezuela, and I will not go into the details of that, but when um, the United States has a specific interest in a Venezuela, in a Cuba, in a Colombia, there are two elections that just happened in um, South America, in Ecuador, and Peru. When they have those interests, then other countries have to choose sides. Or if they don't choose sides, they then have to try to balance their position in a very difficult geoeconomic and geopolitical environment. So their competition is really how not to get trampled on, how to be on the right side of who is the most powerful. And I think it's a very, very important point for people to understand. We see it frequently playing out where the countries obviously pick a side, and that makes it very difficult to um, promote and encourage the unity that the region theoretically wants for itself. We can't really talk about the Caribbean without talking about the largest island in it, Cuba. Cuba right now is under heavy embargo from the United States, and it's such a heavy list that the only countries who make this qualification with Cuba are North Korea, Iran, and Syria. The Cold War is over. Cuba hasn't housed Russian troops in years. Why are they still on this list? The United States and Europe, to a certain degree, have a liberal democratic um, vision of how countries should be organized. And, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, I mean, if you look at Cuba, what it was in the time of Meyer, Lansky, and Batista, it was, as usual, a playground for the rich people and movie stars and so on. Um, When that regime came to an end, um, whether you uh, think that Castro was a flaming communist and wanted to nationalize things, or any other kind of epithets that you want to put against the the regime as it evolved, in the beginning, it was still throwing off another dictator. And so people were tired. And I think that you're right. It's very difficult to think about the Caribbean. Uh, Cuba has 11 or 12 million people. And, uh, you know, certainly a great deal of 
intellectual power uh, resides in that country. But, you know, there are people that were totally disaffected. And, you know, so this is a longstanding position, which uh, was eased up, um, you know, really from Bush through Obama. And um, because people in, I mean, Fidel was old, he died. You know, the other brother is gone. How long does the punishment continue? With the Biden administration now, they are going to have to make some determination about politics in the United States and foreign policy in the region. And the politics of the United States, especially um, the how do I say, the emigres, the now U.S. citizens that came from Cuba and who also come from other places like Venezuela, are constituents of the United States now, and they have a view. And, uh, you know, they have been wronged and they want punishment. Um, you know, in a higher consciousness, you're not going to punish those people that are still living there because... They are not the ones who are responsible. So one of the first things a lot of people think about when they think about the Caribbean is the amount of tax havens in the area, whether it be Panama, the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands. There are a lot of tax havens inside the Caribbean. Why are there so many tax havens in this region? And is it the dominant region or is it just the ones that get the most press? An organization called taxjustice.net lists these countries as those that um, are the true tax havens. The Netherlands, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Hong Kong, um, Jersey, Singapore, and the UAE. And so what we have here is a huge perception about these offshore tax havens. Now, it is true that the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands, the Bahamas to a certain extent, all have offshore banks. Now, why did they do this? Because the development agencies, and I won't list them by name, but you, you understand that there are people who advise poorer countries, and they were advising them to diversify away from tourism. And they said providing these kinds of banking services would be a way of doing that. So on that advice, from those who are supposed to know, you started to have offshore banks. What is an offshore bank? It's really a place for you to park your money, if you are a corporation, until you can deploy the capital elsewhere. And generally you do that so that you don't have to pay tax in a certain jurisdiction. So that's, uh, you know, what it is. And we know that uh, poor countries are, they don't have big companies, so they are not the ones parking the money. And it is, uh, there's a certain inequity to the perception that has been created about offshore banking. But there are problems, don't misunderstand me. There, you know, because the flows of money not only money, but narcotics and arms and people, because those flows of money can happen in the wide open space that is the Caribbean, which is difficult to police and to monitor. Although these Caribbean nations are right on the US doorstep, they aren't very high priority in terms of US aid, forcing them to quite often look elsewhere for desperately needed funds. Do you think the US should be donating more money to these Caribbean nations? The Caribbean should be taken more seriously. All countries should be taken more seriously. And the fact is that you just simply don't want to have failed states anywhere. Um, this volcano can create a failed state, for example, a hurricane um, and deforestation, for example, has created an almost failed state in Haiti, if not one actually, I don't know what the exact definition of failed state is, but I suppose it's one that can't take care of its own people, doesn't have systems for self-determination and agency. So to the extent that you have um, countries like that 
uh, near you and on your borders, it's very interesting to see how they can develop economically and socially and therefore create greater prosperity in the region. And, uh, you know, we've seen the, the, the Biden administration up the amounts that they've given to COVAX for vaccines, which is incredibly important. But, you know, health has become a security issue. So I think the United States uh, understands this, and but small size, you know, can have you in a position of being overlooked until something happens. It's a fairly common opinion that the world never got closer to nuclear war than the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1961, where the Soviets put nuclear missiles into Cuba pointed toward America. And the Americans were so uncomfortable with this position, they were willing to remove them by any means. We even got to the point where the planes were taking off from Florida airfields in preparation for the bombing of Cuba, and inevitably, the beginning of World War III. It's pretty weird to think that the giant that is the US was so terrified of the island of Cuba that it would be willing to start the Third World War. Even to this day, after the Cold War is long over, Cuba is still regarded by people like John Bolton as the leader of the Troika of Evil. Even though, at this point, the only foreign country with bases on the island of Cuba is the US base at Guantanamo Bay. The Russians left after the breakdown of the USSR, and America once again took dominance over the Caribbean. But now other countries may be lurking around, looking into the position the Russians left, a position in the US's soft underbelly. But which country is weighing up these options? And would the US be willing to start World War III again to prevent another country moving into Cuba? Well, for that, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. Trouble in Paradise Well, the Caribbean has no choice other than to be outward-looking because these are small economies that depend on foreign trade, both in goods and services. Uh, but the trouble is the rest of the world has not shown much interest at looking towards the Caribbean. So uh, the Caribbean suffers, uh, with some exceptions, uh, from uh, neglect, particularly compared with the situation they faced during the Cold War when they were considered of uh, some importance due to the rivalry between the Soviet Union and the US. Victor Bulmer Thomas is an associate fellow for the US Americas program at Chatham House, specializing in the Caribbean and Latin America. He was also the former director of Latin American studies at London University, a former director of Chatham House, and has written more than 20 books on the subject. He joins us today. The US record in Haiti has been absolutely dismal, uh, really going back to its first military intervention in 1915. But nonetheless, they keep Haiti on a kind of life support system where the patient doesn't exactly die, uh, but it has very little chance of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a full recovery. And the US's concern is, as much as anything, to make sure that no other actors are too heavily involved in, in, in Haiti, but they're not prepared to make what you might call the major commitment in order to uh, help Haiti through uh, decades of underperformance. So before we get into the main topics of today's conversation, I want to get your opinion on this. Do you think the Monroe Doctrine still exists in 2021? Uh, that's an interesting question because uh, every time that a US Secretary of State uh, declares it dead, another one comes along and declares it alive. Um, I assume that the new Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, even if he doesn't say so, will uh, uh, act as if the Monroe Doctrine is dead. Uh, but in practice, um, it very much depends on which country you're talking about. I mean, clearly, as far as Cuba is concerned, it is dead uh, and has been for a very long time. But if we're talking about, say, Haiti, where the US effectively runs a protectorate, uh, then it's not dead. And depending on what happens in the other islands will very much depend on the geopolitical situation at the time, and in particular, the competition between the US and China on the one hand and the US and Russia on the other. So we understand the complicated relationship between the US and Haiti, 
But what about Puerto Rico? What is the long-term strategy for the US territory here? Do you think it's more likely to become a full US state or remain a territory forever? Or will it become an independent nation? What do you think? Oh, I can see it becoming a US state. I mean, the, the independence option has more or less died. I mean, that was a live issue up until the 1950s. But since then, the big debate has been whether to stay in its current status, which is effectively a US colony, uh, but obviously enjoying various privileges uh, as a US colony, or whether to become a full state. And um, the argument for statehood has been gaining uh, a lot of traction in the last 10 years. And now there is a majority of Puerto Ricans who favor it. Of course, the trouble is it doesn't just depend on them. It requires a decision by uh, the US Congress, in particular the US Senate. And it's widely assumed that if Puerto Rico became a state, its two senators would be Democrats because of the close connection between politics in Puerto Rico and the Democratic Party in the mainland United States. And inevitably, the Republicans will oppose that. So it's not going to become a state until uh, uh, the Democrats in Congress and are in a position to significantly outvote uh, the Republicans. The same is true, by the way, of the U.S. Virgin Islands, which is also a colony in the Caribbean. And if they became a state... And that argument is really just beginning now, then they, as is assumed, would also uh, uh, vote for two Democratic senators. So the politics of Puerto Rico and, and the Virgin Islands are now very much caught up with the intense rivalry between the Democrats and Republicans in the US. The Monroe Doctrine was written to keep European powers out of the Caribbean. But one of the major players who was there for a while and did pose a challenge to the US was Venezuela. At what point Venezuela was supplying many of the Caribbean nations with lots of oil and finances. But obviously now there is a lot less of that going on with the collapse of the Venezuelan economy. Do you think the US worries about a Venezuelan resurgence in the area? Uh, not now. The problem is not the expansion of the state. That was an issue for the US uh, earlier on for the reasons that you mentioned, because uh, via the scheme called Petro Caribe, uh, which provided oil on very uh, generous terms to oil importing countries in the Caribbean, and also through membership of ALBA, a body which still exists, by the way, and in which Venezuela helped to establish. Those two things have given Venezuela considerable uh, purchase in the Caribbean, and several small countries normally very uh, friendly and uh, supportive of the United States, had joined ALBA because they could see that the benefits for them from uh, a close relationship with Venezuela were very considerable, despite the displeasure of the United States. Now, of course, uh, Venezuela, its economy is in such terrible shape that it's not in a position to provide any measure of support for these uh, Caribbean countries other than for Cuba, which is a separate uh, relationship. Uh, but the problem for the United States is, of course, all the Venezuelans who are leaving Venezuela and creating problems for US allies, such as Colombia and uh, Trinidad and Tobago. And so uh, it's not so much the Venezuelan state, it's the Venezuelan people that are now causing headaches for the US administration. Venezuela is often seen as the primary native enemy of the US in the Caribbean, with the Trump administration and John Bolton going as far as to label it a troika of evil alongside Cuba and Nicaragua. We understand why the US is so combative toward Caracas and Havana, but why Nicaragua? Why the US tension there? Nicaragua is not in a position to offer either Cuba or Venezuela the... Uh... Uh, the kind of support that, that, that they would like. In fact, if anything, it's the other way around because uh, Venezuela was extremely uh, helpful for the Nicaraguan economy when, uh, before its economic crisis, before the economic crisis in Venezuela. And similarly, uh, Cuba was also uh, able to provide uh, all sorts of uh, support. Now, I think the relationship uh, uh, between the three of them has had to be inevitably downgraded a little bit, not out of ideological reasons or anything like that, because they still see eye to eye in, in many respects, politically and ideologically, but simply because all three 
are facing very severe economic problems and um, they have to put their own interests first. The one exception to that, Michael, I should say, of course, is, is Cuba-Venezuela, which remains a, a very tight and close relationship despite all the difficulties in Venezuela. There are many outside powers who have gotten involved in the politics of the Caribbean, but one we don't often think about would be India. A lot of Caribbean nations like Trinidad and Guyana have large Indian diasporas, brought over by the British during the colonial times. Do you think India will try and leverage this for influence in the region? Well, it's, it's something that we all assume would happen, but it hasn't. And I think that there are various reasons for that. Um, you have to remember that those who are of Indian descent in uh, the Caribbean, particularly in the countries that you mentioned, like Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago, they are of both uh, Muslim and Hindu faith, or of no faith at all. Um, and whereas in India, of course, you have a Hindu nationalist in power. So a Hindu nationalist has very little uh, interest to uh, those uh, Indians and in or those Indo-Caribbean uh, people in the, in, in the Caribbean of, uh, they don't see um, a close relationship with <coughs> uh, India in its present incarnation as anything particularly attractive. Uh, and so uh, India, I think, has found it difficult to project itself in the Caribbean, partly because it has so many other issues it, it's uh, involved with, and also because uh, it's not at all obvious that the Indian community in the Caribbean would, would speak with one voice in, 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 in welcoming India. Now, that could change in the future. Uh, India might roll back from its current uh, phase of Hindu nationalism and become more... Um, open to uh, uh, other faiths and uh, other views and so on. But that's not the case at the moment. And so I think there are limits to what we can expect from uh, Indian incursions into the Caribbean. One of the big players in the region was Russia, particularly in places like Cuba and Guyana. But what is Russia's influence in the region like these days? Uh, outside of Cuba, it's uh, not very important, but it's extremely important in Cuba and becoming more important year by year. Uh, the Russian state and Russian private business are heavily involved in helping to upgrade the uh, Cuban economy. Uh, they're currently involved in building a, a, a high-speed rail uh, uh, all the way across the island of Cuba. The island of Cuba, by the way, is absolutely ideally placed geographically for a high-speed train from the west to the east, um, following the line of the old rail tracks that were built to serve the interests of the sugar industry. Um, but Russia is involved in much more than uh, infrastructure. It's involved in uh, in uh, uh, military to military links, in uh, in tourism, in uh, just about every sector you choose to name. And you should really think of the Cuba-Russian partnership as a strategic one at the, at the present time. It's very important for Cuba. Noting the importance of Russia to Cuba, do you think we'll ever see Russia reopen its bases on the Cuban islands? Well, I don't think you can ever say never. Um, and clearly, depending on the relationship with between Russia and the United States, there might come a moment where they feel there is uh, some diplomatic mileage in, in, in doing that. Uh, but it would open another front in the already tense relationship between Russia and the United States. And so I would imagine they would be quite cautious about that sort of uh, uh, that sort of. Uh, move. But in terms of uh, broader support for the Cuban economy and making the, sure the Cuban economy can not only survive, but also uh, uh, wean itself away from the impact of the very damaging trade embargo with the United States that is currently in place. Yeah, that will definitely continue. Russia obviously used to send a lot of money in arms to Cuba over the Cold War. And in return, Cuba sent a lot of fighters to go fight in places like Angola. You know, does Cuba still have that ability to do power projection over long distances like they did in the Cold War, or are those days far behind them now? Well, I think you have to distinguish, Jim, whether uh, from a technical point of view, they have the military force uh, from the question of whether they would ever wish to use their force in that way. 
um, Cuba probably does have the military power to mount an invasion of another country, but it would never dream of doing so. And, uh, and, and that has never occurred to it. I mean, it's one thing uh, entering a country like Grenada during the Grenadian Revolution at the request of the Grenadian government, providing uh, military and other support. It's, it's quite another entering a country aggressively uh, in order to impose its will. Um, and neither Cuba nor Venezuela would do that. I'm not sure actually whether the Venezuelan military is even technically able to do that at the moment because uh, although they have been privileged relative to the rest of society in terms of the uh, salaries and wages and so on that they receive, they are a much reduced force in terms of their, their, their um, ha hardware and uh, uh, intelligence uh, equipment and, and all the rest of it. So uh, we shouldn't think of either of them as aggressive actors uh, in the region. No, not at all. In 1983, a left-wing uprising took place on the small Caribbean island of Grenada. Then President Ronald Reagan ordered a full US invasion of the island in defense of the US friendly government. If something similar were to happen today on one of these small islands like St. Kitts or Nevis, do you think we'd see a similar response from the United States? Were that to happen, yes, without a doubt. Um, there, No matter what the geopolitical thinking on uh, the Monroe Doctrine and other such things are, there is no doubt that the US does not see small countries as the Caribbean as being in any real sense sovereign, and therefore it wouldn't have any hesitation to uh, intervene uh, if it felt its interests were were uh, under threat. I mean, the US intervenes all the time in uh, Central America and Caribbean countries. Uh, it's just that it's under the radar and doesn't uh, normally come to the attention of the of the media or even of uh, social media. Rather than a fully sovereign state like Grenada, what if we looked at one of the European territories like Aruba, owned by the Dutch? If there was a popular uprising on one of these islands, do you think we would see military response from the European powers? Well, the French, inter I mean, they're all very different because uh, the, the three French uh, uh, territories, well, there are more now, of course, uh, but the original three were Département d'Outre-mer, that's uh, uh, French Guyana or La Guyenne, uh, Martinique and Guadeloupe. Now, subsequently, two of the dependencies of Guadeloupe uh, broke free from Guadeloupe and became uh, Communité d'Outre-mer, that's Saint, Saint Bartholomé, and also Saint Martin, the island which is shared with Saint Martin, uh, which is a Dutch <laughs> dependency. Now, these five um, French territories, uh, the three original départements, together with Saint Bartholomé and, and Saint Martin, they are part of France. Uh, they are as French as uh, Calais or Boulogne or anywhere else. So if you're asking how would France, uh, the state, uh, the French military, whatever you want to call it, how they would react if there was an uprising in, in one of these things. Well, it'd be a, exactly the same as asking how they would react if there was an uprising in Marseille or Bordeaux or Nantes or somewhere like that. Of course they would. They'd go in and they, they'd crush it. And they have shown uh, on numerous occasions that they will uh, uh, not hesitate to do that. Uh, for the Dutch, it's, it's much more tricky because... The um, six Dutch islands have gone a very different way. Three of them have chosen to go the way that Aruba did in 1986 and become um, uh, autonomous uh, uh, parts of the kingdom of uh, the Netherlands. And so they have some autonomy and therefore there would have to be a very uh, substantial uh, threat, if you like, to uh, the international order for the Dutch state uh, to intervene. I'm talking about Aruba, uh, Curaçao, and um, uh, uh, St. Martin. But then you have these three small islands of uh, Bonaire, uh, Seba, and St. Eustatius, which are effectively Dutch municipalities. Uh, they are like sort of small towns in, in, in Holland. And clearly, because of that different constitutional status, 
the Dutch government would intervene very quickly if anything happened in those three small islands. So, as I say, now with the British, where there are five islands in the Caribbean, six if you include Bermuda, but that's not really in the Caribbean. So let's talk about the five. The issue is not so much about um, the possibility of a, a revolution or um, breaking away or anything like that. It's much more to do with their status as uh, tax havens. And um, while Britain was a member of the European Union, uh, Britain was able to get the backing of the other uh, member states to ward off uh, uh, the threats to the uh, fiscal autonomy of these islands. But now that Britain has left the European Union, it looks like it'll be increasingly difficult for Britain to uh, protect what goes on in these places like the British Virgin Islands uh, or the Cayman Islands or the Turks and Caicos or indeed Montserrat and Anguilla, just to name the, the other two. So, um, uh, the situation is looking very tricky, and it, you may have noticed that a couple of months ago, uh, the um, British government effectively intervened in the British Virgin Islands on the grounds that the uh, current government there was uh, exceedingly corrupt. But I think this was a way of trying to clean up uh, uh, the situation in order to ward off uh, an even greater threat from the island's perspective coming from the European Union in trying to strip uh, uh, these islands from being able to operate as tax havens. One nation we haven't talked about much on this piece yet is Mexico. For such a large country with a G20 economy, they don't interfere in Caribbean politics as much as you probably would have expected. Why does it Mexico project into the Caribbean as much as something like Venezuela or Britain? Uh, well, it's a good question. Uh, and, and of course it does, uh, but it doesn't um, play it up. You have to go back, of course, to, to tradition, uh, the Mexican tradition ever since its own revolution a hundred years ago of non-interference in uh, other countries' affairs. So uh, Mexico is always very... Uh, 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 cautious about uh, projecting a kind of neo-imperialist image. They don't want to be seen in that way and they don't want to act in a way that might lead others to uh, identify them in that way. Having said that, uh, Mexico has sometimes uh, projected uh, itself into the region in a very positive way, I should say, uh, but in a very significant way. So, in the 1980s, together with Venezuela, they did create a, um, a, a subsidized uh, oil export scheme for countries of the Caribbean. Um, and it was hugely popular and uh, adopted and taken up by all the Caribbean countries that were, that were eligible. Um, that then uh, dropped away. And then when it was revived, it was only Venezuela that took part uh, rather than Mexico itself. But Mexico has good relations with just about every country in the, in the Caribbean. It has good relations with Cuba. And of course, um, uh, <laughs> the person-to-person uh, uh, -person, uh, contacts are very substantial, not just in the level, in the, in the sense of tourism, but also through family ties and, and all the rest of it, because uh, the Yucatan Peninsula is the home to, uh, uh, many people of uh, Caribbean descent, and uh, those links help to keep alive a very positive image for Mexico and the region. Could it do more? Yes, but it's not really the Mexican style. Um, as I say, they draw on this long tradition of non-interference, and uh, what they want is to try and have good relations uh, with all the parts of the Caribbean. For example, they recognize Maduro in, in Venezuela. They don't want to get drawn into uh, what they think is a blind alley of trying to pretend that somebody else is the president of Venezuela. And uh, I think that tradition will continue. So a player we haven't mentioned yet in this piece is China. And China's been putting a lot of money into places like Dominican Republic, as well as Jamaica. What do you think China's overall strategic goals are in the Caribbean? It's essentially about trade and investment. Uh, this is not about trying to build a, 
a sphere of influence that would um, uh, rival that of the United States. Uh, but because China is such a large economy and because it's so co much committed to overseas investment, and because of the Taiwan issue to some extent, uh, China does have uh, huge interests in the Caribbean and uh, in Central America as well. And that will continue. Um, some of these investments are state, but most of them are, are private investments, private Chinese companies, and they have uh, huge resources. And this is at a time when the Caribbean is starved of external investment from other sources, whether it's Europe or the United States. So, of course, um, they find uh, a welcome. And while um, there are some grumblings in the Caribbean about the practices of these Chinese companies, in particular, their preference to employ Chinese labor on infrastructure projects or the uh, threat to uh, local uh, wholesalers and retailers from uh, uh, Chinese um, merchants themselves. On the whole, China is, uh, is welcomed in the Caribbean. The trouble is that whereas China has a clear strategic perspective for the whole of the Caribbean, uh, there is no such equivalent on the Caribbean side. So each country is struggling to formulate its own policy vis-a-vis -vis China. And there is as yet no pan-regional approach to uh, dealing with both the opportunities and challenges that, that China presents. Do you think we might ever see a repeat of something like the Cuban Missile Crisis inside the Caribbean, with China placing hypersonic missiles in places like Cuba or Jamaica? Well, like we said about Russia and Cuba, you can you can never say never, but clearly that would be a huge step up in terms of uh, friction uh, with the United States. And I can't see why China would want to take on that added uh, uh, friction at the moment when it is uh, trying to uh, manage that relationship in a less uh, confrontational way. As I say, I think the, the main motive for, for China in the Caribbean is all to do with uh, trade and investment and uh, making sure that uh, Taiwan has less and less state-to-state uh, um, -state, uh, relationships uh, to uh, support the government there. If that were to take place, though, what do you think the US response would be to China putting missiles into Cuba? Ah, well, you have to understand that China would only do this, and I think, as I say, it's extremely unlikely uh, that it ever would, but it would only do it if it was uh, fairly sure that the US wouldn't react in that way. So we're talking about a time when China is much stronger and the US is much weaker, and that will come, uh, but we're not there yet. I mean, we're probably talking about 30 to 50 years down the road before that will be even a, a realistic uh item on the agenda for the Chinese uh, leadership to discuss. They're certainly not going to be doing that now. And, and no, none of the governments in the Caribbean would want them to do that because they don't want to be dragged into this confrontation between uh, the US and China. What they're hoping, uh, and it's a difficult thing to do, but, but they're doing their best, is to have good relations with, with uh, all these external players, uh, US, Europe, China, and India, and Russia. Uh, they don't want to have to pick and choose, and they don't want to be put in a position where they have to pick and choose. Uh, the Trump administration tried to make them do that, but they were not in power long enough to uh, go very far down that road. I don't see the Biden administration making that uh, a sort of uh, litmus test of uh, loyalty, if you like. So for the moment, I think there's good reasons to assume that countries in the Caribbean can have uh, good relations with uh, with all the outside parties. Um, but what they have to do is to think more strategically about what they want from these relationships, whether it's with China or with India or with Russia or indeed with the US itself. So my final question is, do you think the US will become more or less powerful in the Caribbean over the next 20 years? And the same goes for China. Do you think they will become more or less powerful in the Caribbean over the next two decades? Well, I think that's a fairly easy question to answer because uh, the trends uh, globally will, I think, be uh, 
matched uh, in the region. And the US is clearly, uh, I have a book of a couple of years ago called Empire and Retreat, uh, the uh, past, present and future of the United States. And uh, uh, what uh, was, and I think still is, uh, 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 an empire uh, in the sense of, in the terms of the United States, is clearly not in a position to exercise the same leverage and power in any part of the world as it was before, whereas China, uh, in the next 20 years, uh, not necessarily in the next 120 years, but certainly in the next 20 years, is going to be uh, an increasingly uh, powerful actor, and that will... Uh, you'll be able to observe that in the, in, the, in the Caribbean as well. And I would expect within the next 20 years, no country will be still recognizing Taiwan as the legitimate representative of, uh, of all of China. Having said that, having said that, uh, it is quite natural for empires in retreat to focus on their immediate hinterland. And for the United States, that immediate hinterland is, of course, uh, Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, Mexico is a separate matter. I think we have to leave that aside. But the temptation for the US to try and, as it were, retain a tighter grip over events in Central America and the Caribbean, I can see being uh, quite a powerful temptation, but I don't think it will succeed because uh, these countries themselves uh, would resist it. And certainly they would be able to find in China an ally uh, willing to help them. For the time being, it seems the US will maintain their foothold in the Caribbean, whilst keeping a close eye on ever more desperate states like Cuba and Venezuela. The whole region is regularly devastated by natural disasters, suffers incredibly harshly when tourism drops, and for many of these countries, they are at the mercy of larger regional geopolitics, so things can change quickly. Whoever can control the Caribbean can control the Panama Canal and the approaches to some of the most important US ports, such as New Orleans and Galveston. There is a reason the US were willing to almost start World War III to blunt the Soviets' ability to strike at them from Cuba and those fundamental threats posed by an enemy nation so close to the US still remain to this day. The US spends so much time worrying about threats coming from the other side of the world, but it may be time to start paying more attention to what is happening right in their own backyard. Thank you so much to everybody who tuned in this week. This was a pretty fascinating one for us to put together, as this is an area of the world I think a lot of people tend to overlook, and that's myself included. In this episode, we touched on one of the key issues of the Guyana-Venezuela border dispute, but if you want to dig a little further into that, you can either check out our full piece we did on Guyana last year, or you can watch our recent short five-minute animated video going through that exact topic over on the Redline YouTube channel. It's a very interesting aspect to this conflict, and a dispute that will shape a lot of the politics of North and South America for quite a while to come. If you want to find out more about these videos or simply follow up on polls, stats, maps, and quizzes, we post a lot of that on our social media. So you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, Reddit, and Swell on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or you can find me on the Twitter handle at Mike Elliott Oz. Oz is in Australia. This show would not be possible without the amazing support of our Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each week to help us keep this show going. Our Patreons get to join in on game nights, live Q&As, and even get extra materials from the show. Our Patreon donations all 100% go back into the program, helping us pay for staff, programs, hosting, websites, and lawyers that are essential for running a show like this. I cannot thank our current Patreons nearly enough for their support of the show. If you feel like you could spare a couple of dollars a week, we would greatly appreciate it. A huge thank you to all of our guests this week. Ivor Law Griffiths has been on the program before and was absolutely amazing to work with again. Ivor Law is one of the leading authorities people turn to to discuss the Caribbean, and we're thrilled to have him back on the program. If you want to check out some more of his stuff, you can find him over on Twitter at Ivor Law Griffith. Vicky Acevedo is one of the best local voices that come out of the Caribbean, and she has been working tirelessly to bring more attention and help to a region that desperately needs it. She's written a number of great papers on the subject, and I highly recommend you check those ones out. 
Victor Bulma Thomas is one of the most trusted people anywhere in the world when it comes to geopolitics, even being at one point the former head of Chatham House. It was amazing to chat with Victor on this subject, and we'll be sure to have him back on the program sometime soon. As usual, here are our three recommended reads for this episode, if you wanted to take this subject more seriously and really study into it a bit further. The first would be From Slavery to Services by Victor Bulma Thomas, all about the rise of the Caribbean. The second would be The Caribbean Blue Economy by Peter Clegg, focusing on the economies of the region. And the third would be A Brief History of the Caribbean, From the Arawak to the Carib to the Present by Jan Roganiski, focusing on the complicated history of the Caribbean. This show would not be possible without my fantastic staff. Mark Spencer has been doing extra voiceover work for us for quite a while now, and we couldn't be proud to have him as part of the team. He's currently putting together a petition to get Apple to add a climate category to the podcast section, so people can easily find more information on how climate change is affecting the world and what we can do to help. It's a great initiative, and if you want to go check it out, you can find him on the Twitter handle at Climactic Show. Just the first of many great things Mark is coming out this year. Owen Swift is an absolutely amazing addition to the show. He's taken a large role here at the program, doing writing, researching, and helping to redesign the website. The show is making huge steps forward thanks to all of Mark's hard work. And if you want to find Mark on Twitter, you can find him on the handle Owen A. Swift. Marissa Rafter has just joined our team as an animator, turning these episodes into short videos that have been absolutely phenomenal so far. She has the ability to take an incredibly complicated topic and make it really easy to understand. We are absolutely thrilled to have her as a part of this team. Joe Hawthorne once again does amazing work with his audio skills, making sure these episodes sound as good as they possibly can be. And if you want to find him on Twitter, you can visit him on the handle at Joe Hawthorne 77. The last thanks go to that to you for tuning into the show. Watching the show get bigger and bigger has been nothing but amazing. And nothing makes me happier than watching all the comments and feedback coming in in the days following episode drops. So if you ever had a comment on the show, we would love to hear it. I honestly, I really, really enjoy getting to meet all of you and chatting in the comment section. We'll be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.